Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Keith. By God's grace, Alcoholics Anonymous, room full of people like you, and a little bit of effort on my own, I've not taken a drink of alcohol nor done any kind of narcotic since May 11, 1976. And for that, I'm especially grateful. Thank you. Boy, this is a, uh, it's like talking to your home group. For me, I, uh, boy, I got people in this room that are uh, just, uh, you know, had a, had a tremendous effect uh, on my life, uh, and and for many years, many years, and been in my home. Beth's been in my home. Larry's been in my home with my wife, and and uh, a number of other people have been into my not only just standing out here behind a podium somewhere or hanging around in a restaurant or a, a hotel, but uh, come into my life, come into my home, and uh, and see how I live. And there's no secret. And of course, the old timers uh, in this area are, uh, you know, that's God calling. <laughs> uh, the the old timers in this area are just phenomenal, and uh, and it just, I always just, uh, I, I get just, it's like taking a shower from the inside out, and uh, when I get an opportunity to enjoy, like I did this afternoon at the old timers meeting, and. Uh, Boy, Tom capped it off, and it was just what a what a group. And uh, and of course, the speakers this weekend, uh, up until now, have been great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the 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 speakers, I I know, and I've been with them and around, and, and uh, what a what a great deal. Uh, what a, I mean, it's just a good thing. It is not the point is I, I I go around quite a bit, and and it isn't always this way. So one of the things that uh, you know, it's like. When I sobered up, why I needed to go to 30, 60, 90 meetings in 90 days, and I did that, got a sponsor, and I got a newcomer, and I went to meetings, went to meetings, went to meetings, went to meetings. And then sometime after I was sober a little while, I was asked, my wife and I asked to come out on the weekends and, and do these conventions. And, and uh, over 30 years ago, and it scared me because I was used to the foundation and the safety net that I had in my home group, and then when I got an opportunity to come out and do these things, it's a form of service, and to do these things, uh, the old-timers told me, build that safety net out here around the country, and I did that, and I met people, uh, Chip and the guys and gals from Columbus and the various people around, and they know me, and I communicate with them, and I built a safety net, and I built a, a, a you can't call it sponsorship, but old timers in my life that keep me in check. I'm an alcoholic, and uh, if you don't keep me in check, uh, I'm a mover and a shaker and a candlestick maker. I'll guarantee you, <laughs> and uh, and it'll get down and dirty. And uh, Beth and her girls cornered me in the restaurant this afternoon <laughs> and give me a good old fashioned talking to. <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. I need it. I need it, uh, and, and I'm grateful for it. I love them so much. It just uh, there's no way to express it. I'm very, I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. Very fortunate. My wife sends her love. She's in Oregon at a woman's conference, and uh, and she told me to be sure and tell you folks that uh, she's doing good, and she's with a bunch of good people there. Uh, my daughter is in uh, Milan, Italy. She's been over there for over 22 years, and uh, she also has 33 years in the program. My wife has 33 years in the program, and I have 33 years in the program. And there's been no sabbaticals. There's been no time off for good behavior. Uh, we've been there in the trenches doing it every day, every day, every day, every day. And, and uh, it's just necessary. And uh, and I'm grateful for that. My daughter's forgiven me, and, uh, and I have two little granddaughters who uh, love me and and do not fear me. They don't have no reason to fear me. And I believe that uh, I'm at least a fifth-generation alcoholic, and at least 
uh, one of the motivations of continuing to do the things that I do in a program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that maybe if I continue to do it, my wife continues to do it, my daughter continues to do it, just maybe the chain is broken. Just maybe the chain is broken. What could I, I wish for it? Just in case the Bible's right, I'll go for it. You know? and, and I'm very grateful for that. I've been married to my wife for 50 years. Uh, you think the steps are hard, try the marriage vow. <laughs> I wanted to divorce her, but she doesn't believe in divorce. She believes in homicide. So <laughs> I sobered up and I said, you're not always what I want, but you're what I need. And boy, I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> I love her so much. We have a great relationship. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm very fortunate to have a lady in my life that went through uh, 15 years of my drinking prior to the program. So uh, there's never been a day in this 33 years that she's resented the method of my recovery, I can assure you of that. She's never told me to stay home from a meeting. She's encouraged me, and uh, and so is my daughter, very supportive. And uh, and my daughter tells me frequently when we have these conversations uh, that if I were to pick up a drink, I'd never see her, her or my grandchildren again. And uh, that, is, that threat doesn't keep me sober, but it's a truism, uh, and I know that. I, uh, I was born in Texas, and that doesn't necessarily make you an alcoholic. It's a kind of a disease of its own. Uh, <laughs> and so you know the difference between a fairy tale and a Texas tale. A fairy tale starts out once upon a time, and a Texas tale starts out, you're not going to believe this shit, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> Like I said, I'm at least a fifth-generation alcoholic, and all the character defects from my family kind of rolled downhill, and, and, and it's not a braggadero type thing. It's just if you're going to be a budding alcoholic, it's good to grow up in, a, in an alcoholic home. There's alcohol there. And by the time it rolled down to me, why all the character defects of each one of the other alcoholics, which were all different, it seemed like they all rolled into me. So I became the family's best, worst example. And... Uh, and it, and it started out at a very early age, at a very early age. I was kind of a kid that got in a lot of trouble all the time. As a little kid, was always in trouble, always in trouble. And uh, uh, all the women went to church and prayed for the men. And I had a little brother, Mikey, and uh, and uh, we were always in trouble, always in trouble. And, and they t Grandma said, I'm going to take you boys down there to see that preacher if you don't straighten up. And... And we'd get in trouble. We was always in trouble. Finally, she said, come on, we're going down there to see that preacher. I had a great big old church down there. And she drug us down there, and she told Mikey, said, you go in there first. And little Mikey went up the steps, way up the steps, and down. And that preacher's down in there. And uh, Mikey got down there, and that preacher just looked down on him, and he said, I just want to know one thing. Where's God? Mikey didn't know what to say. And that preacher said, I just want to know one thing. Where is God? And Mikey jolted, and he ran back out the steps. And when he went by me, he said, come on, man. Somebody stole God, and they think we did it. <laughs> That'll make you want to take something back that you didn't even steal. <laughs> But I got in trouble. I grew up in a in a farming community, and I could drive. I got a driver's license when I was 12, and a, a farm permit to drive uh, farm equipment, and that was good. I got a car, and I got three kids in a car, and we was going to get some uh, three two beer, and uh, in that part of the country, the county option, and the Baptist uh, usually voted to get the liquor license. They bought the liquor license, tried to keep liquor out of the county, but there was always something close, and and uh, we had a guy going to get us a case of beer. We'd already drank a little that somebody stole. And I was backing down an alley, and a kid ran out behind my car, and uh, and I ran over him. And his mama was standing on the porch watching me do it, and I, I threw the car in gear and drove over him again and broke his other leg and left the scene of the accident. And in 1952, I was locked up for that. 
from 1952 till 1955. I was locked up behind barbed wire. No big deal. I wasn't in no grandiose penitentiary. I was in there with a bunch of other kids, and but there was no girls in there, and we couldn't get out. And I learned a lot of things. There was a lot of things in there that I learned. I learned that it don't make no difference whether you're pitching or catching, you're still playing ball. And, <laughs> and uh, I learned how to survive. I learned how to survive. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. I got out in 1955. And by 1956, 1957, I was uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area, and I had a little gal with me, and uh, we just got married, and, and I, I was supposed to deliver some outside issues over to the other part of town in this car, and uh, and I was drunk and loaded, and I and I took off, and and I had an accident, and there was bodily injury, and I left the scene of the accident, and, uh, and as a result of that, uh, I was locked up. Uh, for another three years uh, down there, which in, in that period of time, I I learned a lot of things. They didn't have anger management and all these various other things. I just learned how to survive. You know, you heard Danny talk about that. It doesn't take long to learn how to survive, where to stand, what to do, and uh, and I don't regret any of that. Matter of fact, those periods of time where I was incarcerated helped me survive the 33 years I've been here in Alcoholics Anonymous. Matter of fact, if you can survive Alcoholics Anonymous, you're doing pretty good. And uh, and there was things that uh that I uh, and I, that I did because I was incarcerated and people the regiment of that and and you had to have a team. You you did things. You had to work as a team to survive. And and I learned some good things. I got out of there and. Uh, I got my hundred bucks and a new suit. And I got a bottle of whiskey and got on a train. Took a train from uh, down in South Texas. I got I was in Huntsville. I got out of Huntsville and I went, got a bottle and got on a train and I did my first uh, fourth and fifth step on that train with a bottle of booze and I reviewed my life and I need to stay out of them honky tonks. I got to stay out of them honky tonks. I get in them honky tonks, get in trouble every time. I got to stay away from them sick women. <laughs> There's some of them in here, I can feel them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're ready, they're ready. They're... Wow. Oh. oh. And I got to stay out of them fast cars. And, and I just reviewed my life, and the train pulled into the station there in Amarillo, Texas. My two very best friends, Oily and Goose, were waiting there in an old pickup. They had a jar full of cross tops and a couple of fruit jars full of moonshine. Looked like white gasoline. Had things floating in it, dead bugs, and good stuff, you know. <laughs> and, uh, they'd been sitting over there listening to Wolfman Jack on Del Rio, Texas, and, and uh, run the battery down, and we got a push start, and I got in there, and I started doing my first fifth step. I told Oily and Goose, I need to stay out of them honky-tonks. I need to stay away from them sick women. I need to stay out of them fast cars and away from guys like you. And they agreed with me. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and we'd drink that stuff and take a handful of bennies and... We went down, first stop was down at Wolf Creek, a place down where the men are men and the sheep run scared, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, there ain't no law down there. It's, it's down and dirty. There ain't no law down there. Whoever's there is the law. And I went to this old Quonset Hut barn, and I, the band had uh, taken intermission, and I grabbed a Coke ball and rolled it down, bumped the stage, and I said, let the meanest sucker in the house bring that back. I'm in town. I'm back. And it looked like a stampede coming my direction. <laughs> I may be sick, but I ain't stupid. And I hit the first guy leading that charge, decked him, and ducked into the woman's restroom. And I, <laughs> on the way into the woman's restroom, I t this gal was standing there, and I said, tell me when the fight's over. And she'd, pretty soon she'd come in, and she said, the fight's over, now you can come out. And I went out, and the band was playing. She is handy. I'm a quick study. I said, where you been all my life? And in one quick dance, I found out she had a car, a job, driver's license, money in the bank and a place to stay, none of which did I have. And she said she just got out of an unwed mother's home, and I said, I just got out of the penitentiary, so let's go together and give two people a break. And, uh, <laughs> and that, was, that was over 50 years ago, and we're still there. Yeah. I found out later she finished that fight that I started. <laughs> We went together for two weeks, and they nicknamed us Hatchet and Hammer. <laughs> I mean, it was, if somebody, we beat the living tar out of each other all the time. Somebody wasn't bleeding, why, there wasn't no passion. 
We just have them big old fights and just wrestle around and call it foreplay. <laughs> it had to be love. It was just too painful to be anything else. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just... People, they'd send people over to our house to save us, preachers and this and that and the other, and we'd get in a big argument and beat the hell out of them, go to bed and make out. <laughs> she got pregnant and said I was the father, and I don't remember that. I must have been crossing over the invisible line when that happened. I don't <laughs> but I, uh, <laughs> we got married, and, uh, you know, started out that, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I, I hear people all the time try to describe all that stuff. I just drank. I just drank and hung around with guys that drank. And I I never, you know, really, you know, I'd drink a little beer and think maybe I ought to do something, smoke a little weed and fantasize how I was going to do it, shoot a little speed so I'd have the strength to do it, do a little coke so I could be cool when I did it, and drink a little whiskey and forget what it was I was going to do. I don't know. <laughs> I never specialize. <laughs> I'm a pig. The only thing I never have is a pap smear. <laughs> That's what I got to look forward to if I go out. I did drink with some people that'll give you one, though. <laughs> got in trouble, got in trouble, always got in trouble, moving around. And, uh, Finally, my buddy, I had a buddy named Lion Shorty, and Lion Shorty told me he could get me a job on a ranch 40 miles west of Long Beach, California. That's ocean. <laughs> but a guy named Lion Shorty wouldn't lie to you, would he? Huh? Nah. And uh, I loaded up my family, got the wife and the kid and the dog and the cat, and got all our stuff in the trailer and, and uh, went by Oklahoma City to get a prescription filled in a baggie, and uh, <laughs> and I set out to go to, to Los Angeles from Oklahoma City. It took me 30 days. <laughs> Most people can do it in three, you know? but I was lost a lot, you know? You know how you are? And she'd say, why don't you pull over and ask somebody where we're at? I thought, I don't want to do that. Then they'll know I'm lost. I don't want anybody. And... Uh, Sometimes I'd sleep for three days, and sometimes I'd be straight up for three days. It was just insane. By the time we got there, while the dog was standing in the, had the seats laid down in the station wagon, the dog would stand behind me and drool all over me, and a truck would go by, he'd run to the back of the station wagon, slam his head into the back of the station wagon, fall on the cat, they'd have a dog and cat fight. The kid would be bawling, and she'd be whacking a bitch, and I'd be drinking one day at a time. <laughs> crazy. I knocked the mirror off the right side of the car, and she's hanging out of the right side of the car seeing if there's traffic over there. Got busted just as soon as I crossed the line. California Highway Patrol said, we we don't have no human rear view mirrors here in California. You need to get some. <laughs> Only way I could shut her up. It was crazy. Everybody's crazy. Everybody's crazy. I found a, drunk, a drunken uncle out there. He got me a deal on a house nobody lived in for a while. There's a motorcycle gang lived on one side of me, a bunch of hippies lived on the other. And I moved into this house, took my wife and kid, and moved right into this house. And I'd left Oily and Goose back in Texas, so I needed to make some new friends. I went over to Hippie's house and he introduced me to Doc and Professor. <laughs> <laughs> they had some stuff you take it and lay in the front yard naked and watch the sun come up and go down. <laughs> It was just crazy, and I'd take off and go run and do things and come home. I always brought my friends home with me. You know, they're the ones that don't, go, don't want to go home and fight with their wife, so they come on over and watch me fight with mine. <laughs> my wife started carrying this butcher knife. I had an old 12-inch butcher knife she carried around all the time. I like guns myself. Guns will get your attention. I had a 44 Magnum with a 2-inch barrel, and I'd pop a cap in your ear. You'd pay attention to me. You wouldn't hear nothing, but you'd pay attention to me. <laughs> I'd stick that gun right on the end of their nose, and she'd just be whacking and yakking and neighbors yelling, shut that woman up, and I'd stick my gun on the end of her nose. She'd stick her knife right in my stomach, and she'd say, you go first. <laughs> You've got to be crazy, woman. If I shoot you, you're dead. She said, I know. When the bullet hits me, it'll knock me back, and the knife will go forward, and you'll die too. <laughs> 
You know, crazy women don't have to train for that. There's no boot camp for that. <laughs> they intuitively know that. <laughs> she just beat the tar out of me. She had these old high heel shoes, and the and the heel was off of it. And there's a little wire inside of there. It's it's round thing. And when they whack you with that, it leaves a little funny mark with a little <laughs> thing in it. It's hard to explain to your friends. You've been in a terrible fight with this big giant. When you got wax and you got things bite marked, they ain't hickeys, they're bite marked. <laughs> it always kicked me down there. I'm always walking straddle legged. Never fight fair. And uh, it was just like that every day, every day, every day. I finally got busted and I'm in jail. I've been in jail many times and, and I go in front of the judge. He's got my thing. And this was long, long, you know, in the 60s. And, and, and he had my thing and said, I've been arrested 57 times for assault and battery and resisting arrest within a 10-block area of my house. <laughs> I told him, I said, I'm trying to tell her to at least give me a two-block run and start. <laughs> Gee. And, uh, and, of course, she wasn't in the courtroom, and that makes the judge unhappy. And so he, he said, I can sentence you to three to five years, but I'm going to have you go talk to this guy in AA. And I had an old guy in AA. I didn't know what AA was. He said, you can go to jail or go to AA. I didn't know what AA was, but I knew what jail was. I owed some people money in jail. And uh, so this little old guy, Ivan Miller, he looked like he's drunk yesterday, and he's over 20 years sober. You know, one of them guys, you want what I got? Come go with me. <laughs> I said, can you get me out of this courthouse? I mean, I had long hair, long beard. I had a pair of cut-off Levi's, no identification, no underwear, no socks. I was traveling pretty light right then. <laughs> and old Ivan Miller gets me out in this old pickup truck. He's got things rolling around in the back. He drives over there and shows me this church where there's an AA meeting. He takes me home. I'd been in a fight, had this big old bandage on my head, and sewed my ear back on, so I had a blood soaked earmuff there and he showed me and he said I'll meet you over there tonight okay I got out and I went in I was tired I was sick I laid down on the old vinyl couch I'm laying there trying to figure out how I'm going to get out of this deal and she comes home she's been to see a lawyer and the lawyer told her I should go to AA so she's got a new idea and so she comes in the house and said you need to go to AA and I said I thought it'd come to that and I found a meeting, and they have a meeting there tonight, 8.30, and it's over 10. Maybe I'll go. She said, okay. So she got busy filling around. At 8 o'clock, she come over there to take couch with the butcher knife. I said, get up. I said, why? She said, you're going to A. I don't know. She said, I know. And she jabbed me with that butcher knife. I said, get up. Now, let me give you this picture. My house was painted four different colors because I lost interest easy. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, the family wagon was a baby poop brown pinto with no reverse and a hole in the muffler and went down the road crooked. The wind on the driver's side was half down, half up, and my wife wore these great big beehive hairdos with a can and half spray net in it, and she, and she, when she drove it, it'd suck her hair out the window. <laughs> so she always looked like the leaning tower of pizza. My kid looked like a wounded animal, had hair in her face, and down had an old coat on. And you couldn't see her face, and she walked around like a wounded animal. My dog had chewed all the hair off his body everywhere his mouth had reached. <laughs> she had a permanent twitch and dry mouth, and the cat had a permanent puff tail. And I got this blood-soaked blood earmuff on, and we go out and get in the family wagon to go to the first AA meeting. <laughs> and and we, we drove up, she drove over there and pulled up by this church, a big AA sign out there, and I remember looking in, probably just like, I don't know how many people, 30, 40 people in there. And they were nice, and they were in there, and I could see in there. And I remember thinking, well, I've sunk to the bottom now. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from where we just left, that's called low-bottom snobbery. I don't give a damn where you come from. That's that's low bottom snobbery. I'm looking down on those people, and I'm out there in the car. And she jabbed me that knife. Said, "What time is the meeting over?" I said, "It's over ten. She said, "I'm going to tell you something, Ace. If your ass comes out of that door for ten, I'm going to gut you." <laughs> now you can keep me in there. I mean, you got a crazy woman circling the perimeter with a 12-inch butcher. 
I may be sick, but I ain't stupid. I'm staying in there. I know about that. I passed out on her, and she stabbed me all over my body. When I came to, I said, oh, Lord, what's the matter with me? And she said, you broke out of acne of the back. I'll get to rubbing alcohol and pour on you. And she did. All the time. Perpetual revenge. I know about that stuff. So I went to the AA meeting. I went and sat down, counted all the squares in the ceiling. Look, see how many light bulbs was in. I know the old timers. They got the hair growing out of their ears. I know which ones they are. I said my last name. That's wrong. Now they know. And she waited right outside. Through the meeting over, I didn't, nobody said nothing to me. Nobody did nothing. Nobody. I bolted and I went right out and got in that car. And she took me home and I laid back down on that couch. And for about four weeks or so, maybe longer, I don't remember, but I laid on that couch. Monday, I go to the meeting. I go back and lay on that couch, healing up. Never drank, never did nothing. I said, dry as a fire hazard. I just laid there. And nobody, nobody talked to me. They could tell it wasn't true, you know? So nobody really talked to me or romanced me or anything. After I beat the deal at the courthouse and what have you, she said, you can go now. I got in the car. I filled my glass. Got in the car. And I went and got drunk. I got drunk because I wanted to drink. I went by that AA meeting, told him I resigned. <laughs> Guy said, you must be going to go to b and B. I I said, what's that? He said, I don't know, but where are you going ain't AA? I'll tell you that for sure. And I did. I got drunk. And I got sober, and I went to AA, and then I went to AA drunk. And then I went to AA sober, and got up at coffee break, went and got drunk. I come out of a blackout in AA meeting. That's scary. Whoa! I would have left, but I didn't know who brought me, you know? Kind of have to hang around and see who says, come on, let's go. Nobody, nobody, nobody told me not to do that. I wasn't disruptive. I was just drunk. Just drunk. And I... I go to meetings. I went everywhere. I joined the Masonic Lodge. I was doing my third degree proficiency in the Masonic Lodge at the same time I was prospecting with the Hells Angels. Now that's a dilemma, let me tell you. <laughs> when I passed through the green door, it was red and white on the other side. I guarantee you it was insane. And, uh, you know, it's like spinning the plates. Everything was going on. Everything was going on, and everything was falling down, and it was just, uh... I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something that I know about me. And people, I know there's a lot of young people in here, and people in here who might understand. But for me, now I drank, I started drinking when I was seven. And, and I didn't drink alcoholically when I was seven, but I had the taste. I had an acquired taste, and I sought madly for that feeling and that euphoria again for many, many years. I was 36 years old when I finally sobered up. But the last six years of my drinking, I also used narcotics. And I want to tell you something that happened to me. I got so evil. I got so evil that it's unexplainable. I became so dark and the combination of things that I was putting in, and the lower I went, the farther I went. That's a culture. And I became so evil, so evil, that I honestly believe it was absolutely impossible for me to ever recover again. I passed through a point in my life. Evil, evil. I got a wife and daughter the way I'm... I'm not taught of the culture and the way I lived and the way we thought and the harm, the harm that was done and the damage was done that not only did I accept the fact that I'm drunk and nothing will work, I also got so evil and so dark that I knew that nothing, nothing could bring me back. I know it's because of what I was putting in me. I had no answers. I had no answers. Not only did I give up, I didn't, I wasn't mad at God. I, I went to a level Shame, shame, I'll take you way past shame. And I thoroughly believe that I could not recover from that. No way. No way. And I got so sick. So sick. So sick. And one more time, 
one more time at a point in my life, lip dragging drunk on the floor, I asked for help. I asked for help. I asked for help unconditionally. Unconditionally. I asked for help with no condition. If you don't stay sober and you keep drinking, you're going to have to come back to AA. And you're going to have to come back to AA. And I had to go back to AA. And I asked for help. And a little man that I would have never drank with, he would have never even came to where I drank, came to my house. Little Jack Callahan. Little Jack Callahan came to my house. Because people, there was people praying for me. You see, I can get so evil and so dark, but that does not stop the prayers. The prayers of the people. I'm here today because of the prayers of the people. The prayers of the people that I could find something. And little Jack came to my house. I stuck a gun in his face and said, if you take me back to one of those nut wards that's over right now. He did something he'd never done before since. He grabbed that gun, threw it in the house, pushed me back down on the couch, and I started, I started crying. I started bawling. I start bawling, just just start crying. And I'm sitting there just sobbing. And little Jack, he was a Marine fighter pilot. He just tall enough to make the deal. And and uh, little Jack came over and sat down beside me. And he said, now, I've seen you around here for a long time. If you want to get sober, I'll help you. you got to come and go with me. That's what happened to me. So many people want to know what it used to be like, what it's like today. The what happened is so important. It's so important. The what happened is the point, the point of desperation. When I was sweetly reasonable, when a man that I wouldn't even had anything to do with came and said, I'll help you, but you're going to have to follow me and do what I say. And I did it. I did it. I grabbed a hold of that little man. He took me to a detox. Detox. Nothing. How about some hard candy and Valium? Something like that, you know? No. Eat a banana. You need potassium. Detox. They detox me. He kept me in there for at least 90 days, feeding me, and wouldn't let me take three steps and laugh, three steps and cry. Detox. Detox. I don't ever want to detox again. <laughs> oh, if nothing else, I remember detox. Oh. And they kept me in there, and people came in there. They called the hospital institution people. God bless the people from H&I. People that come into the hospitals and the nut wards and the jail. And these people came in there. And that's the only people I saw during that period of time. And there was a group of people coming into that that detox uh, from a men's group, men's stag meeting. And there was a little guy named Rotten Ron. And Rotten Ron came in there. Rotten Ron came in there. He was rotten. He was nine years sober. He was rotten. I mean, rotten, rotten. He said, I'm Rotten Ron. I'm your sponsor. I said, what's that, a friend? He said, no, if you want a friend, get a dog. (laughs) I got a dog, and he hates me. He said, I'm going to be your sponsor so an idiot won't be running your life. You. And he uh, he come see me. He come in and see me. He come in and see me. And he told me I need to do a four-step before I get out of there. I said, well, I can't do that, man. I can't put nothing on paper, man. If you find if people find out what I did, they'll lock me up. I'll never see the sun again. He said, put it on paper. I said, well, I need a tablet. I need a big tablet and a big pen. He said, no, and he took a matchbook out of his pocket, and he took the matches out and the, and the little paper clip. He gave me that little piece of paper and a pen, a little piece of pen, a pencil, like a golfer's use, a little tiny pencil. And he said, here, do your four-step. I said, well, he said, I'll show you. Number one, you're a liar. Number two, you're a cheat. Number three, you're a phony and a fake. I said, I can do it from here. (laughs) So I got one of them psychiatrists in there and detox, and I did an immoral inventory, a fearful list, and a sex inventory. There was a guy in there. He was working there at that detox. He was from Alaska. He's Eskimo. I said, I need to do my sex inventory with you. You're from Alaska. You know some things. (laughs) 
I told him my sex inventory. He told me some stuff he did up in Alaska. And, whoa, they do some weird stuff up there on the tundra. Yeah, there's only so many things you can do with a human body, you know. We laugh. We laugh just like you laugh. You got to laugh at it. It's just too sick to do anything else with it. You got to laugh. You got to laugh. I mean, we survived it. So what? And uh, but I did it. I did it. I'll show you. I'll do it. And, and Ron come and got me and three or four other people. And he had an old box van. Box van. Old Ford box van with nothing inside but plastic milk crate. He said, get in, grab a crate. And we took off. And he stopped and we all slid, you know, up to the front and he'd take off. We all slide to the back. And I remember sliding up between him and the other old timer with three years. And uh, I slid up between them and I said, I killed a man with my bare hands. And he took off and I slid to the back. And this 300-pound newcomer fell on top of me, and I would have choked him, but I was crying. <laughs> so abusive. They weren't nice to me. They didn't give. They gave me tough love. Shut up. Sit down. You don't have nothing to say. You can't talk for a year. <laughs> say your sobriety day. I went down to rent. Uh, people were after me. I owed $250,000 to people. You can't write them a letter and send them, you know, 100 a month. I had all kinds of people mad at me. I had people after me, after me. So I, I, uh, when I was sober just a little while, I started, I had some experience working in the oil fields and I went down to Midland, Texas. Danny was talking about them old guys down there and I, God love them. Man, I'm telling you, they got me in there. And, uh, I said, I can't pray. I don't, you know, I just talk to God anytime I want. I said, no, you need some prayer. And the guy said, take your boots off, put them under the bed. And while you're down there, give him a shot. I said, well, I can do that. So I went back to the motel room. I was staying down there working. And, uh, and I took my boots off, put them under the bed, and I said, okay, God. All right, God, I'll make a deal. I'll never say the F word again. And I got up, I laid down, and a guy from California called me up, and he just started using that word all over everywhere, and I started using that word with him. I said, man, I just told God I wouldn't talk like that. Now you call him and talk to me. And I did it. And he just laughed. He said, you're sick. You're really sick. Yeah. You see, but they uh, they kept me. They steered me. Those old timers steered me. They wouldn't let me get out of line. They wouldn't let me. Had a little old gal I was down there talking to, and I called up our friend there, and, uh, and I said, "You need to get her away from me." And he said, "You know, I can't imagine why a guy might call up and make that phone call if he didn't think about what he was about to do." And I said, "You're absolutely right." See, and I had to. I had to stay away from home for a while so some healing could go on. And my wife went to al on and released me. And my daughter went to Alateen and released me. And the dog went to Alley Dog and the cat went to Alley Cat and they all released me. And I was just going to meetings and going to meetings and, and I was trying to do the thing. I did whatever they told me. I went all over, worked and made that money so I could pay it back. They told me I need to pay that money back. I paid that $250,000 back with interest. It took me 14 years of sobriety. I did not have an overwhelming good feeling about it. I did it because I didn't want to get drunk, and I didn't want them to kill me. And uh, and I did those things. I did those things. And I would come home, and I would be able to go to meetings. In the first three and a half years of my sobriety, I only slept in, in my house with my wife uh, 61 times. So we needed a lot of space. It took a lot of time for that healing. We were so violent that I went home in, in the first part of my sobriety, and we started talking. The next thing you know, I got my hands around her throat, and, and I just, you know, I recalled like it was from a hot stove. I said, can't do this. And they told me about the absolutes. And they told me my absolutes was that I can't cheat on my wife, I can't hit anybody, I can't write any hot chicks, and I can't debate God. And those absolutes are just as absolute tonight as they were on my first day of sobriety. And I remember I told my wife after I was sober a little while, I said, you know, I haven't cheated on you. She said, well, you're not supposed to. <laughs> yeah. But I said, you know what? I'm trustworthy. I'm trustworthy. People that say, trust God, clean house and work with us. Trust God. I'm not trustworthy. The curse of a thief is that he can't trust himself. I'm not trustworthy. And, and the first thing that I did that, that I had some period of time that I could leave with a carload of guys from Alcoholics Anonymous and go off for a weekend and do something and come back, and my wife wasn't checking me out. She knew that I'd been with the guys and I was sober, and I came home sober. A couple of times I did some 
you know, pretty crazy stuff, a bunch of newcomer stuff, and I come home and my wife said, well, did you, I worried all about you. I said, well, let me tell you something. If I hadn't have gone and done that with them guys, you know, we went on some trip and went somewhere and gambled or something, came back, just stupid stuff. But I said, you know, I learned something that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't gone, and I came home sober. See? And those were good things. Understand. Understand. And my daughter, my daughter played all kinds of games with me. You know, I mean, she was beat down, and she started coming out, started blooming like a flower. And I remember, you know, I was a disciplinarian from a distance. I couldn't discipline my kid. I was gone all the time. I was such a such a bad father, and I and I couldn't take care of things. And I I started trying to be a father. And uh, my wife said, "You need to do some discipline with her." And I remember one morning I I caught her telling a lie, and I grounded her or something, whatever, some little thing. They told me. Don't assess a punishment on your child. It's more of a punishment on you than it is on the child. And uh, so I grounded her for a day, one day at a time. And uh, on the way to school, Simone said to me, he said, Daddy, you know, I can go in that school and I can get some of them drugs and go with those people. And I'm coming down the street in front of that school and uh, man, my old heart just went boom. She's like 14, 13 and a half, 14. And I pulled up in front of that school, and I said, the only thing I can, I, I don't know anything else to say. The book says our past is our greatest asset. I pulled up in front of that school, and I said, baby, let me tell you something. You can go in that school, and you can get that stuff and use it. And you surely know what it will do to you, because you saw me do it. And if you choose to go down that road, it's your choice. But I'm going to tell you something. we got a sober home. And if you choose to go down that road, don't come home. We have a sober home, and you can't go in there and get on them drugs and come home. Understand that, and understand that I love you, and I will always love you. always be my little girl. And I opened the door, and she hopped out. I cried all the way home. When I got home, I told my wife what I'd done, and she started crying. And I know there is no spot where God is not, because that little girl went in there, and she made a decision to not pick up her choice. And many other times, those kind of things happen as she was growing up, as she was becoming a lady and, and, and making the transition from a little girl to a woman. And and I had to change. When my wife would bring those ladies over to the house uh, that were al and and they'd be over there reading the book and doing the steps, I had to treat them like a lady. I couldn't be grab-assing with them like I did the girls down at the bar. and that I had, to, I had to treat them like women. And that was a change for me. I'd want to impulsively act like a smart-ass and do those things, and I had to change. The old-timers told me I had to change. They didn't say, you need to change, we'll watch you, and you got plenty of time. They said, you need to change right now. You need to quit telling her what's wrong with her. I said, well, if I don't tell her what's wrong with her, who's going to tell her what's wrong with her? Somebody needs to tell her what's wrong with her. They said, I don't know, but it's not going to be you. My, I sobered up in May of my first sober Christmas. My wife invited her mother-in-law out to see me sober. Yeah, and her brother Jack, who didn't work and ate all my pork chop. <laughs> and so come right before Christmas, my wife's working at the office, and she went to the office party. She went to the office. I said, you going to the office party? I'm going to the office party. I'm the office manager. I'm going to the office party. I said, you better not drink. You better not drink. Well, they told me when I got out of detox, I can't keep her from drinking. I'm the one that's got the problem. And I heard that. And I knew what she's going to do. They got them great big old margaritas over there with all them straws coming out of them. I knew she's going to drink. And I told her, you better not drink. She said, I'm going to the office party. Nine o'clock, eight o'clock. Here she comes. I'm sitting there with mother-in-law. Yeah. And brother Jack. Yeah. And I got to go to a meeting. Yeah. And they want to know why I got to go to me. I need to go to me so I don't beat you up and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here come my wife in. She's got that glow on. Her cheeks are rosy. And she comes in. I said, you went to the office party? Yes. And I said, and you drank? She said, yes, I did. I said, where are you going? She said, I'm going down on a meeting. I got to lead it tonight. <laughs> I said, well, you better skedaddle because I'm going to choke the pants off of her. And she went to a meeting. For two weeks through Christmas, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I would look at her. And I would think I was going to tear the skin off her and put her on an anthill, pour honey on her. She would wake up 
and look at me, and I'm over. I'm sober. It's my first Christmas, and I'm looking at her. And she drank. You realize I can't drink? She can drink, and I can't drink. She can do something I can't do. My woman can do something I can't do. You're going to die. I'm just not sure how. <laughs> People, old timers would come and get me, and I'd just be crazy. It's Christmas time. They'd take me over to their house, and their kids or grandkids would, here, look at my toy, and I'd grab it. I'd break the toy. <laughs> crazy. You know what my wife did? She called her sponsor and said, I need to do a four step on this. She told me, I'm going to do an inventory on my drinking. I said, well, good. You better do a good one because you need to be ready to go to heaven. <laughs> uh huh. Can't suck on a drunk girl's tongue and stay sober, you know. All that trash. You know what she did? She went and did a fourth step and a fifth step and came home and said, I'm not going to drink anymore. What? She said, I'm not going to drink anymore. I said, how in the hell can you stop? How can you just stop like that? How can you just make a decision to just stop? She said, because I'm not an alcoholic. I can do that. She did. She ain't drank sand. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> she won up me again. <laughs> My daughter, my daughter went to Alateen. I'm looking for God. He ain't lost. I know that. I know he's here. I just can't find the key to the door. I read the back of that book where it says it's a spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening. I went to a meeting where he was reading about it. And I went in there and I said, when am I going to have mine? I need to have mine. Come on. Give it to me. Lay it on. And they said, you are a miracle, idiot. <laughs> Go home and look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. And I did. And there was somebody home. I couldn't believe it. I went to a, a convention that had Alateen participation. My daughter was a spiritual speaker. My daughter. My little girl. She got up there and talked about God. The only thing she had left was God. And she, I was, uh, I was in awe. I thought, if she can do it, I can do it. See? And my wife had an experience that she felt good about and she had in touch with. Her. We're always the last to know. Why do we have to be the last to know? I don't know, something about alcoholics. We just need to be the last to know, you know. And uh, there I was. I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, I, you know what I did? They said, you need to work with newcomers. And they took me to a meeting, and they made me the secretary of the meeting and got me a coat and tie. Don't see an art closure for twenty seven ninety nine with a little hanky in it. Had to shave my beard, clean up, look good, look like Lou over here, man. <laughs> Hey, Dan. Yeah, fine. I'm doing fine. Yeah, fine. Yeah, fine. I got a gun in my back pocket. I got a knife in my boot. I'm, I've got so many weapons on me. If you bump into me, it'll be a mushroom cloud. <laughs> and I have reason to be paranoid. If you sit next to me and I get what I deserve, it's going to splatter all over you. And I'm secretary of the meeting. And I'm a cake guy. And a treasure. And I got to hug people. And people come in there and hug me. Big old guys that hug me. Oh. I said, don't hug me. I'm going to kick you. He said, no. Where two or three, where two or more gather, where, put our arms around you. God's in the middle and we'll embrace and God will be in the presence. I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. I got a tingling sensation and I'm questioning my sexuality right now. <laughs> <laughs> and they just hugged me. They loved on me. I'd talk all that trash where I've been, what I did, and they just come up and hug me more. They love me. They love me. At three and a half years sober, I almost died because I was, before when I drank, I ventilated. Very physical. Very physical. Very physical. And when I sobered up, that stopped. And the anger, I couldn't ventilate anymore. When I sobered up, it was just like, Err! and I stuffed, and I stuffed, and I stuffed, and I would write. And it looked like I wrote with a Hershey bar, I hate you, and I'd pass it to you in the meeting. And people would put X, 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 X on it and pass it to me back. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> and they just hugged me and hugged me. And uh, at three and a half years sober, I bled nine pints of blood out because when I stuff that anger and it goes inside, I hemorrhage. It just affects me physically, and I just hemorrhage, and I just... And I got so weak, I couldn't get up. Three and a half years sober, they come and pick me up, took me in the emergency room, put me in the emergency room, and, 
and uh, the doctors started pumping blood back in me. My wife and a bunch of AAs came over there to see me, and the doctor said to her, you know, he, he bled nine pints of blood. You only have 13. Did you know that if he would have sneezed, he would have had brain damage? And my wife said, how would we have known the difference? <laughs> and people from AA come over there and said, we love you, don't die. <laughs> I wanted to flip them off, but I couldn't raise my hand. <laughs> they come over there and give me a bone marrow test. They had a coring tool and a big hammer, put it on your pelvis and pull the core out to see if there's something wrong. There wasn't nothing wrong. It was untreated alcoholism. That's what was wrong. I was hemorrhaging and twisted, full of anger and hate, and it's all inside. It's like an ingrown hair. It's like an ingrown hair, and people come over and say, don't die, we love you. <laughs> That's funny. You wouldn't even say hi to me when I was sitting in a meeting. Now I'm over because they knew I was weak. <laughs> I thought, who's going to get my car and my boots when I die? And they pumped blood in me and some food, and I got up and got my boots on. We're back over to that meeting. I'm standing there. I'm secretary of that meeting. I said, I'm back. I didn't die. I'm standing there. Pretty soon, this guy come up next to me. Little old guy. Wasn't short enough to be a midget, tall enough to be a man. Weird guy. <laughs> had a welder's hat down over his ear and hair everywhere. And he had, he had thongs on. He painted his feet black with shoe polish so it looked like he had socks on. I said, you want to do laundry, huh? He said, no. I said, how about your shorts? Oh, yeah. I said, what do you want? He said, will you be my sponsor? <laughs> oh, man. I know I've made God mad somewhere, but I mean this. I was waiting on a banker or a lawyer or somebody to come along. <laughs> Hear this? I said, just a minute. I went over my sponsor. He's in the corner over there telling newcomers if they keep drinking, they'll be like me. <laughs> I was the group's best, worst example. And I went over my sponsor. Said, See that guy? He said, yeah. I said, he just asked me to be his sponsor. My sponsor said, yeah, I know. I sent him over. <laughs> I just love it. I love the old timers that just have the... The, the wisdom and the patience to wait till you're about ready to implode. When you're sitting there and you're sober, I'm sober, I've done the cups, I've done the steps, I've done the traditions, I've done it, I'm the inner group, I'm the SF, everything, but I just about ready to pop from the inside out. And they send some dumbass over there. <laughs> Somebody they can't fix, so they sent him over. They sent this guy over there. And I went back and I said, my sponsor says i got to be your sponsor. Said, what do you want? He said, I want to ride home. I said, you go out to that door. I'll go, no, he grabbed me. And he said, we go. And we got to the door and there's two guys standing there. And he pointed at me and he said, that's my new sponsor right here. They looked at it and said, boy, it's going to be fun to watch you two grow. <laughs> I got him in the car and he started talking all that trash. And he said, you ever do anything like that? And I said, yeah. He started telling me stuff. I told him about some of my stuff. He said, whoa, dude, you're sick. We need to, we need help, man. Oh, Lord, we need to be baptized. We need something. We need a sign. We need a sign, a burning bush or parting of the waters or something. I sat in the car and think some lighter fluid and torch the hedge over there. <laughs> He's crazy. He's just talking all this stuff. I'd pick him up. Say, why don't you call me here? He said, I did. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> we go to a meeting, sit in the front row and listen to somebody talk about God and all that stuff. We get out in the car and say, man, we need help. We're not going to make it. I said, Maybe you ain't going to make it, but I'm going to make it. He said, how do you know? I said, because I know God. I know God. He said, well, I want to know God. So I reached in the glove box, got a 45 out, run around in the chamber, stuck it up next to his head, and I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to count to ten, you pray. <laughs> I said, if I don't have a floating resentment, decide to pop a cap on you, you've done step three. <laughs> he did, I did, and he jumped out of the car, ran in there where my sponsor was, and showed that ring on the side of his head where I put the barrel at 45 and ratted on me. <laughs> I told my sponsor I put a gun to his head and made him do step three. <laughs> Ron Ron said, yeah, I know, ain't he spiritual? <laughs> I'm going to tell you something, that guy's still sober, and so am I. And Ron died with 37 years of sobriety, see? So, it ain't who's right, it's who's left, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and some of them bent fenders need a little extra, you know, to get it, to get it. That guy showed up over my house, he's crazier than heck, and said, I need to work the steps, and I, I said, well, I'm powerless, come on in. And came in, I said, I'm crazy, you're crazy. 
So I guess if we've done step two, we need to do step three, right? And he said, you're not going to put that gun up my head and all. <laughs> Get on your knees in here in the kitchen. We got on our knees. The cat walked by and looked funny at us. <laughs> I had that tingling sensation again and kind of questioned <laughs> all this stuff. But he jumped out and threw a bunch of blank paper at me, and he said, that's my fourth step. And I said, you're supposed to write some stuff before you come over here. And he said, I can't read or write. You write. He tossed me a pencil. He started talking, and I started writing. Then he said, do you ever do anything like that? I said, yeah, I did. I started telling him some of my stuff. I knew God was in the room. I knew he couldn't read or write. I put some of my stuff right there in his. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I laid her out. When God sends the dumpster dumpster, get it in there. Put it in. Put it in. Put it in. Get rid of it. Pass it on. And he jumped up and kissed me on the cheek, and we burnt that one. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus is home. And he went out in the front yard, and he hugged me and said, I love you. In front of God and the neighbors and everybody jumped in his old car down the street, he went. And I stood there in my front yard, and it went from the head to the heart. It went from head to the heart. Thank God the old-timers. Thank God the old-timers had the patience. Had the patience. And they paid attention to it. They paid attention to it. Timing is so important. Timing is so important. And I'm grateful that the people that I grew up with, they paid attention to it. And they watched and waited. And they spoon-fed us Alcoholics Anonymous. Spoon-fed us. They didn't say, this isn't something you can cook up in a syringe and slam it, buddy. you got to chew it up, swallow it, and digest it. you got to live it. you got to live it. And they didn't give me any choices. You're not going to cheat on that woman. You're going to take care of that woman. You're going to take care of that woman as long as she'll let you take care of that woman. You don't have a choice. See? You're not going to write hot checks. You're not going to hit anybody. You told the guy, man, that guy needs to be hit. And it's, well, it ain't going to be you. And I believe him. I put my hands in my pocket. I followed these people because they, they had their, their best, their best interest was in me. What an example. I'm so fortunate that the people that, that I sobered up with didn't have options and this and that and the other. There was things that you could do, but they didn't believe in it. Get in the car. Where are we going? They drive off. I, was, I said, why'd you drive off? I said, because you need to, you asked where we're going. You don't need to know where we're going. Get in the car. Next time, just get in the car. Don't ask. I did. Drive all the way up to some prison and they have a lockdown. Drive all the way back. That's crazy. He said, you need to get qualified to go into a penitentiary. He said, I want to stay out of a penitentiary. You know, you need to go. At six months, I lied and said I had a year, and I started going into jail. And I'm going to tell you something. It is the most gratifying uh, 12-step work I've ever had in my life. And I've been doing it for 27 years regularly. I've had, I've had panels in penitentiaries. We had a panel in CIW, California Institution for Women. My wife has an Al-Anon panel. I have a AA panel in there every month for 27 years. There's never been a dark night on our part. We've always had insurance on our car, air in our tires, good cars to take. Nobody give me a dime to go in that penitentiary. Nobody give me nothing. I did it because I made a commitment to it. Went in that penitentiary 27 years ago, that lady's penitentiary. And there was 120 women in that penitentiary. And half of them were in there for killing a guy like me. And you could feel the hate. You could feel the hate. My wife went in there uh, on an Allen, started a first Allen, and there was people in that penitentiary that killed people, stone cold sober. A lady in there doing double life because her husband drunk shot the little 12 year old girl and passed out, laid the gun down. She shot him and she couldn't prove that he killed the girl. And she did a double life, stone cold sober. And my wife went in there and started talking to those ladies. I remember the first time my wife went in there. She said, I'm from al -Anon. said, what's that? And some junky gal in the back said, stood up and said, I'm a, I'm a heroin shooter, and I just want to know what the heck al -Anon can do for me. And I thought, oh, baby, baby, you better have an answer, or we're done. You better have an answer. And my wife stood there with a conviction a strong, strong conviction in al -Anon. She works program just like an alcoholic. It's life or death to her. And she said, honey, let me tell you something. When you was out there shooting that dope, did you have a mom and a dad? Yes. Did you have sisters and brothers? Yes. Did you have children? Yes. 
That's who we are. That's who we are. And if you'll come to my meetings, I'll teach you. I'll teach you something about them and how they felt while you were doing your deal. And that gal sat down. And she's been going in there for 27 years. 27 years. I'll tell you something. How much time I got? Ten minutes? Five minutes? Wow. <laughs> you got to stay under the mark, man. You go two CDs while you're going to a different level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a different level. <laughs> anyway, I'm out there at this penitentiary. I'm at this penitentiary. It's Christmas time. And at Christmas time, they have a big deal at this penitentiary. And all the Jesus people come, all the church people and all those people. Now, they get a pass. The Alkies, they got a strip. The church people come in, and there's one preacher I noticed several times out there at this the penitentiary he goes in there. Nice young man. And I talked to him a couple of times. I don't know that much about the Bible. But there's a couple of parts that I heard a lot of controversy about. So I'd ask him about that. And he'd straighten me out. So I'm out this penitentiary last couple of Christmases ago. And I had a toothache. I'm telling you, I had a toothache. One of them toothaches that just goes all the way down. It's throbbing. And I told my wife, I can't go. She said, you're going. I said, I got a toothache. And you know me, when I'm hurt like that, I'm like a wounded animal. When I'm weak and hurt like that, I'm back in the corner. And you better watch out. And you couldn't tell I had it. Maybe I frowned a little bit, but I had this thing. It's just in my ears going. And I, she said, you get in the car, we're going. And I got in the car and I drove out to that, that penitentiary. And uh, we got out. We went in this room, 900 people gathered in there to go through the gate to go in and deal. And I'm standing, I got back in the corner, and I'm standing in there, and my wife and people with us. And here comes this preacher, and it's like he come in that door and come right to me. Come over to me, walk right up to me. And he said, how you doing? I said, preacher man. Preacher man, I got a toothache that would knock your socks off. I'm telling you, I'm a wounded man. I'm in here in the corner, and I'm hurting. I got a toothache, and I'm supposed to go in here and do my thing. And I got a toothache. Will you pray for me? Now, I thought when I said that, maybe when he got in his thing over there and they were having one of them blanket prayers, he would say something about, he grabbed me. He grabbed a hold of my shoulder in front of all them people. He grabbed, Jesus, come down and save this man. Remove this pain from this man so he can do your Lord Almighty, God Almighty. Remove the pain. And I mean, I'm looking at all these people. Hey. I mean, they're all looking at me. And he said, heal. And they blew the whistle and they all left. Yeah, you know, my wife's going on behind her. I'm going in there. And I sit down in this room. And they had a little program stuff. They had some music. And pretty soon I jumped up and I'm dancing with my wife and I'm going around. That pain's gone. I said, that pain's gone. That preacher man laid hands on me and that pain's gone. Hallelujah. And I told him, well, hey. And I got home and I called my sponsor and I said, John, you know that preacher? He said, I know that man. He used to be a dope fiend. Now he's a preacher. I said, he laid hands on me. He healed me. The pain went away. And my sponsor said, of course it did. Of course it did. You know why? Why? Because you believed in him. You believed in him. Wow. I thought about that. I told some people about that. I thought, well, you know what? It ain't over. Next time I see that preacher, I got to tell him. See? Can't be a secret. I went back out to that penitentiary a month later, and here he come. He walked right over to me, and he said to me, "How you doing?" I said, "You know that night, you know that night when you laid hands on me and took that pain away, and I could go in there and do my thing. You know that you prayed for me, and it worked." He said, "Of course it did. Of course it did. You know why?" I said, "Why?" He said, "Cause you believed in me. You believed in me." He said, "Don't ask me to do it again." I hope you got that tooth pulled. Yeah, I did. <laughs> you believed in me. Tonight I'm going to tell you something, sweetheart, with six days, with three days. You may not believe in nothing, but believe in me. Because it worked for me. It worked for me. This deal, I bought the package. And it worked for me. It changed me. It changed me completely. I resisted change. I was afraid of change. I didn't know what change was. I was just willing to walk through the wall of fear. And you can believe, because I believe. God bless and thank you all.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.